Do our lives at home, in the church, at work, in school, and the wider society reflect what we believe as Christians? Are we mirrors of the truth that we believe in? Are those around us able to see our faith in our actions? When we as believers embrace sound doctrine, the result is transformed and purified lives that produce good deeds. It should however be made absolutely clear that it is not good deeds that bring salvation. Good deeds come as a result of the grace of God in the believer's life. Our salvation and our beliefs should produce good deeds. Our lives should therefore be mirrors that reflect the truth of God in all spheres of life. In the month of August, we are looking at the book of Titus. This book highlights that what we believe, that's our faith, influences our actions or behavior. May the Lord help us become mirrors living lives that reflect His truth. Titus chapter 2 verse 1 to 15 it says you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine teach the older men to be temperate worthy of respect self-control and sound in faith in love and in endurance likewise teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live not to be slanderous or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train younger women to love their husbands and children, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that the, no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching show integrity seriousness and soundness to those who oppose you maybe in your teaching of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you in your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. From verse 9, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, to the, gr the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave, him, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should do to teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. And that is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Introduction of this sermon, which uh, I would like to title it Godly Character for the Whole Church. In our introductory sermon last week, we were introduced to the demands of godliness that God puts upon those that are to be appointed in the office of the elder. That those who become leaders in the church, and so Paul leaves Titus in Crete, and he asks him, to straighten the church and, and, and perhaps what he meant, establish leadership, establish guidance, establish order in the church. But as you do that, bring into office leadership 
that will lead the churches in Crete. And he says, elders. And as he says elders and focuses on the elder and his family and the requirement of godliness, he will then transition from that teaching in chapter 1 and say that these requirements and demands for godliness is not exclusive to the elders. It is not just for those who lead and guide and offer their service to the church and to the body of Christ. But these demands for godliness are for everybody. These demands that I have put on the elders, it is not just for the elders. It is for all people who congregate and worship God. Because that is what makes it possible for him to find an elder who he can put in office. Otherwise, he will not find an elder to put in office if the members of the church and the congregation are not observing similar demands and characteristics of the Christian life. So these requirements of godliness are not just for the pastor, they are not just for the elder, they are not just for those who lead, but they are for all of us. And that is the focus of chapter 2, that the demands that I have put on the eldership are the same demands that I put on the members of the church. But let me show you something in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul begins intentionally in verse 1 and verse 2. He says, Paul, a servant of God, I'm reading from ESV, and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of truth which accords with godliness. The pairing of knowledge and godliness. That the truth that you know should lead to your behavior. And the behavior he's asking for here, he's calling it godliness. Otherwise, if you know, and you do not believe it, and you do not behave like you know, then you fail in the mark of knowledge. But those that have knowledge, then that knowledge must lead them to godliness. The relationship between theology and conduct, the relationship between belief and action is critical for Paul as he instructs his disciple Titus. That if they know and if they believe, then they shall behave. So the focus of this today is what is it that they know and what is it that they should do? How should they behave? Let me quickly go to chapter 2. Chapter 1, verse 16. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. Relationship between knowledge and godliness. They profess to know knowledge, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and fit for any good works. In other words, that if you know, you will be judged according to what you know, because you must behave according to what you have come to know. And so he asks Titus, then make the people know. Don't leave them ignorant. Let the people know. And so, in verse 1, he begins by saying, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. <coughs> this teach here is actually the word speak. The translators have rendered it teach, but it's the word speak in Greek, laleo. And so he says, speak. And he binds chapter 2 with that word. Verse 1, speak. And the last verse, 
which is verse 15, he uses the same word. Speak, but the translators here say, declare these things. Speak these things. So how are they, how are they to know so that then they behave? Titus, you have a responsibility to teach. You have a responsibility to speak to them. And so, point number one is the centrality of the teaching ministry in shaping godly character of God's people. Centrality of the teaching ministry. And you will see that in verse one, he says, teach what accords. He will pick it up in verse three and says they are to teach what is good. These are older women, teaching younger women. Verse four, he moves from teach and he uses the word train. So train the younger women to love their husbands. I hope that you have a pen or you have a Bible so that you can follow. But verse seven, he picks it up again and he says, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, he picks it up again in verse 12 and he says, training us or teaching us the memory verse to renounce ungodliness. And the one that is used here is the one that means to raise up a child, to train a child. That's the one that he uses here. Training us. The grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation to us. But it is training us, teaching us. And you see the importance of teaching. But he will also pick it up in verse 15 and says, teach these things, declare these, teach, these things. The centrality of the teaching ministry in establishing sound doctrine cannot be gainsaid. And perhaps that's why Nairobi Baptist has established itself in this ministry of teaching God's word. It is important that you listen to sound teaching. It is important that you pursue teachings that are correct. It is important that you sit under proper teaching of God's word. Because in sitting under the teaching of God's word, you establish knowledge. But that knowledge would yield godly behavior. That's what Paul tells Titus. So teach, because if you do not do so, then there shall never be knowledge of what is good or what is wrong in Cretans. But imagine he had already said and passed on a stereotype that Cretans are very bad people. We had that last week. I think it should be verse 10 or verse 12. Talking about Cretans, he said, it's a stereotype that he passed on, verse 12. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then he affirms, Paul affirms, this testimony is true. So you realize why teaching of Cretans was important. But it's not just them. Everybody, every community has its own mannerism that can be stereotyped. Even Kenyans have their own mannerism that can be stereotyped. And so it is not just Cretans, it's all of us. And we are given to do what is wrong and what is not right before God. Because we are all fallen. And the effect of sin is not just on Cretans, but the effect of the fall is on entire humanity. But because Christ has appeared, his grace has appeared, and he has come to teach us what is right. He tells Titus, teach. The centrality of the teaching ministry in establishing right conduct and godliness is important. But what is he to teach, brothers and sisters? Paul is to teach sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. And this is a common word in this epistle of Titus, sound. It is a common word in First and Second Timothy and First and Second Thessalonians, sound. Also translated healthy teachings. Also translated 
right but mostly healthy or sound doctrine. It is in verse 1. It is in verse 2, sound in faith. It is in verse 8, sound speech. And so it is a common word, and it's in chapter 1. Teach sound doctrine. But allow me, before I pick up on what entails sound doctrine, allow me to pick up my point number two, that this teaching is to be centered not just on sound doctrine, but on God's word. Centrality of the teaching ministry. But number two, that sound conduct, godly conduct emanates or centered on sound doctrine. Because if the teachings are wrong, then they believe what is wrong, it will dictate the behavior. But if the teaching is right, and they believe what is right, they know what is right, then therein there is a possibility that they will live godly lives. They will demonstrate godly behavior. Friends, sound doctrine is found nowhere else but in this book. If anybody comes teaching other things other than what is written in the pages of the scripture, his teaching is not sound doctrine. If anybody comes teaching what they have written in their books and the books of theology other than what is here, if it does not describe, if it does not dwell on what is in here, then it is not sound doctrine. And so they believe that if you participate in Bible studies that are done in this church almost weekly, they believe that if you commit yourself, for instance, to Bible study fellowship, and you commit yourself to reading of scripture and learning from scripture, then you will be established in sound doctrine. And so he gives Titus express instruction, establish them in sound doctrine, because sound doctrine will yield godly character. But number three is that this godly character for the whole church it is cardinal for all people. Godly character is cardinal. We can have people do all manner of things but if their character is not godly, they do not qualify to become elders in the church. But not just elders in the church, they do not qualify for the kingdom of God. Because when the Son of Man returns, when he comes, he will judge men and women, sheep and goats, he shall divide them. And his standards will be based on their godly character. Not that godly character can result from anything else but from the confession of the truth of the gospel. The assumption here is that the Cretans have already embraced the gospel and experienced salvation by grace. And so the discussion of godly character here is not for people who are outside, but it's for people who are already inside. And so once you have entered inside and experienced the grace of God, then these demands are yours. These standards are yours and these standards are mine. So it's cardinal for all people. And so he says, elders. But perhaps very important for you to notice, Pastor Majid, that the same word he has used to describe elders 
In chapter 1 is the same word he uses to describe older men and older women in chapter 2. Same word. The only difference is the gender. But same root. So he says all people. Clergy in chapter 1 or elders of the church. But he moves on and picks what he said in verse in a verse up there in chapter 1 about the whole family. And so because he has picked up and said in verse 11 they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families. That's what he says in verse 11. So you underline the word whole families. And because they are upsetting whole families, he comes to chapter 2 and says, teach the whole family. And so he picks up and begins by elders. So older men. He picks up older women. He picks up younger women and pairs those with younger men. Then after he has finished that categorization, he picks up workers. The designation of slaves in this scripture sometimes might be misleading. And so you might imagine that this instruction is for people who have been captured as slaves. Verse 9, bid slaves to be submissive. And so you might think that this instruction is not relevant for you because Paul was promoting slavery. No, Paul was not promoting slavery. Is that the construction of society at that time, we had patrons and benefactors. And patrons and benefactors were the rich, the wealthy. They are the ones who owned big farms and owned homes. The rest of the Greco-Roman society at that time was stratified into structures. You have the rich and the wealthy that, that side, and you have the workers this side. And most of the workers were servants. They were slaves. And, and, and amongst them, they were professional people. They were accountants, there were teachers, there were scribes, there were people who were highly educated, there were mathematicians and philosophers amongst this category here in verse 9. And so as you read slaves, some translation says born servants, read workers, professionals. Because there were no industries like East Africa, whatever uh, company, there was no breweries, there was no uh, Coca-Cola, there was no Safaricom. Uh, businesses were owned by people, by rich and wealthy individuals. And those rich and wealthy individuals had workers. And that is the designation here. So Philemon and Onesimus, that's the relationship he's talking about here. Teach the workers. So instruction for the workers, those of you who sit here and work and serve, and so teach everybody. These teachings are cardinal for all people. The teaching of godliness is not exclusive for clergy, is not exclusive for older men, is not exclusive for older women, but it includes younger women, it includes younger men, it includes professionals, workers, people who work out there. The demands of the grace that has appeared and of the salvation that we have confessed is that we will exude and show godly character at home and in the marketplace, in church and in the marketplace, in every place where the Lord sends us where we go. But number four, is the characterization of godly contact. Centrality of the teaching ministry, number one, it is centered on the doct sound doctrine. Number three, cardinal for all people. But number four, is the characterization of godly conduct. What is godly conduct? Look at it now. And focus on this scripture with me. 
for older men, bid older men to be what? To be temperate. Some translations say older men to be sober-minded. It's not that the older men indulge too much in wine, but sometimes when you have become old and you have grayed, uh, sometimes you can, be, you can puff up with what you know and the experience of life. And sometimes you can begin to feel you have known it all. You have lived your life completely. And, and, and nothing, nobody can, nothing can, that song we used to sing, can boga you. So he says they must be temperate. So godly character includes what is temperate or what is sound uh, in terms of uh, some other translation in terms of their own conduct and control. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. That's what characterizes godly conduct. But then he says, older women, and it's not that what is for men, older men, is not for women. It's just that he's continuing and he will pick up things that are important, focusing on that category of people. So older women, likewise. So the word likewise. It brings the things that he has spoken about older men and he says likewise. Older women must also keep in tune with the same character. But they are to be reverend in behavior, not slanderous, or slaves to much wine. I have no idea whether this means that older men are not given to much wine, but this was a characteristic of a Greek women in, in Creta. And so, they shouldn't indulge in much wine or slaves or addicted. They are to teach what is good. And so train the younger women. Love their husbands. Sometimes we have taught Ephesians and never read this scripture that loving is mutual. That the men should love their wives and that their wives should love their husbands. Love their husbands and children. And this is important. Loving of children. Where I come from, a woman believes in those days, and some still do even these days, that a child belongs to the man. And so if you hurt her and she decides to leave and you have disagreed, she lives the way she came. The child belongs to you, Nelson. You, didn't, you took me from my mother's house. I didn't have any child. And so off I go. So Nelson is left there with his children. He has to find a way. I think Cretan women were like that. Or their culture was like that. So he tells them, also love your children. Love your children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home. This does not demean professional women who are working out there, but just be homemakers, kind and submissive to their own husbands. Each of these verses and scripture is a sermon of its own. And so we do not have time to dwell on it. Even the very fact that he says to submissive to their own husbands is extremely significant in this scripture. But we do not have time to dwell on these little uh, details that are here, but extremely important. So that this demand of submission of women is not taken and extrapolated out of context so that they are denied their space in the marketplace because they are supposed to be submissive. 
Paul inserts that little particle there, submissive to their own husbands, so that peradventure they have roles to play and leadership to play in the marketplace, in their professional undertakings out there, this does not become a reason why they are excluded from that space to offer their gifts and especially their giftings in leadership. But perhaps while they are at home, to be submissive to their own husbands. And he says that the word of God may not be reviled. Then he says likewise, and see, he carries the word likewise. Meaning, the things I have said above, please do not think that it's not it's just for that category, but it's for all of you. But now I pick up here little details about young men. Urge younger men to be self-controlled. Remember, he had also said self-control to older men. Self-controlled is important. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. He now talks to him, the clergy, the minister, the teacher. And in your teaching, show integrity. So integrity is one of those behavior, godly. Dignity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Now he goes to the workers and tells them, born servants, slaves, translations put it, are to be submissive to their own masters, the relationship between the worker and their employer. In everything, they are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering. This word is the word, same as corruption. If it was being translated in Kenya today, that word would have been written, not corrupt, but it's pilfering. The interpretation and translation of it is stealing, not stealing. This tells you that these slaves had some space. They had some authority over some resources. Otherwise, if they were slaves in the manner of slaves, then they would have nothing to steal. But these ones here had some jurisdiction, some authority, some exercise of authority and responsibility. You call it what? That's that, that word accountants use. Authority to do what? Incur? Authority to do what? To incur what? Yes. This one, these slaves had that. Are there people here with that responsibility? Anybody like that? At least I am. I have that responsibility. And in exercising of that responsibility, he says, I shall not peel far. Godly conduct means I will not pilfer. Friends, I know that even Christians, and even in Christian institutions, there is pilferage. Since I left university, I have only worked with Christian institutions. And so I know that that happens. I know it happens, it says, Teach slaves not to pilfer, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. If you picked up this scripture elsewhere, he will give instructions to masters. In First Peter, Chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 18, he says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to do good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Because sometimes slaves those days, they suffered. And sometimes workers, employees, are hurt by their employers even today. 
and they are put in places where they feel like they should not be obedient and submissive. But perhaps Paul says, maintain orderly relationship with your employer. But in other scriptures, he will speak to the masters. He will speak to Philemon and tell Philemon, receive Onesimus, not just as anybody else, but as a brother in the Lord, but also as my son. When you receive Onesimus, you receive him as though you are receiving me. He is instructing a master, a slave owner, to receive his slave as though he is receiving an apostle of Christ. And so this instruction is not to entrench slavery, but this instruction is to create order within those that live and have professed and confessed this faith for the welfare of society, but for the glory of God's kingdom. So godly character includes adorning the doctrine of Christ, of God, our savior with our behavior. Now that he has said all these things, he will summarize. One, the source of godliness and the result of that godliness. Verse 11 to 15, see it as a summary of what he has said. For the grace of God for the grace of God. So you might ask, how is it possible to do all these things? How is it possible to do all these things? He says the grace of God. The grace of God has appeared for the master just as it has appeared for the slave. The grace of God has appeared for the older woman just as it has appeared for the younger woman. The grace of God has appeared. What makes it possible for us to live godly lives and to pursue what is right is because we remember one day we were sinners and that we are guilty no more but that God has set us free from that guilt and so the indebtedness the indebtedness of God's grace and mercy drives us to seek and to do what is right what is just and so he says it trains us so that nobody begins to say, I'm excluded from this. It is for a few people who have been selected. He says, no, it's appeared for all people. It has brought salvation for all people. It can train all people. It can train the young ones. It can train the older ones. It can train the clergy. It can train the laity, the grace of God. And he will summarize all those things that he has said. Renounce ungodliness worldly passions and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age waiting for our blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior friends this brings me to the last point the consequence of godly character or results of godly character and this Paul characterizes in different ways to, Tim, to Titus. Number one is about how people respond to us who are Christians because of our behavior. How do the world look at us as Christians and say these are Christians? Incidentally, if you go inside Garissa, Dwajia, Loris, people milk their camels and their goats and they carry their milk and put on the road, on the highway. It will be picked by somebody they have agreed with. They will bring it to Garissa town. It is sold and it, there's a note there. Once you sell, buy for me this and this and bring. They will buy those things and they will come and place them there and somebody will walk from the bush and come and pick their money and the things that they had sent for and go home. And when you ask them why, they tell you because Christians are not here. Yes. 
You understand? Christians are not here. Christians cannot see your land that is not fenced and that is not showing sign of occupation and spare it. They cannot see somebody's money that is available and they have a pen to sign and spare it. And they cannot see, the list can continue. But yet, this grace of God teaches us to renounce ungodliness. So that when the world sees, and so Paul will say to Titus, look at verse 5 of chapter 2. For women, younger women, when they do all these things and wives, that the word of God may not be reviled. And for him, self, see verse 8, what does he say? He says, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. The consequence of godly character is that it will bring honor to the gospel. It will bring honor to the church. It will bring honor to this community. You know, you people, I get offended. You know, this, uh, this plays and this humor that is created on media about lawyers. You understand? I get very offended when they think that lawyers cannot speak good English. And they can only speak the way those cartoonists speak. And I keep wondering, but this Fred is lawyer. Doesn't he speak good English? And so it annoys me. Sometimes they talk about food. You understand? So I get annoyed on behalf of lawyers. You understand? But how come you people don't get annoyed on behalf of Christians? and become jealous, and begin to demand godly character and conduct. It should be possible for you to face me and say, my brother, you're a Christian, you cannot do that. Because when you do that, you offend this community. You offend the household of faith. The consequence of godly character is that the world shall have nothing evil to say about us. Verse 10. For workers, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Beautify the teachings of this gospel. Does your conduct in the marketplace beautify the gospel. Does your manner of life exemplify Christianity? Or does it malign Christianity? Does your behavior at home beautify the faith? Or does it make it impossible for your house girl, for your watchman to become a Christian? Does your conduct in school where you teach or work make it possible for boys and girls, for those university students to become Christians or it makes it possible for them to hate the Christian faith? But the final consequence of this godly conduct is to be seen how he pairs this godly conduct and eternal life. Move on with me. Godly lives, verse 12, in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That godly conduct puts you on a waiting platform to receive Jesus. You are not fearful about his coming. You are even not fearful about death. 
you are not fearful about eternity. You are excited about the future because you are living life that exemplifies the character of God. I'd like to finish and invite uh, the worship team here. And perhaps you are here and wondering, how is it possible for these things? I have not even begun myself. So the things that you're talking about are not possible for me. The grace of God has appeared. It has appeared. And because it has appeared for salvation, for all people, you are included in this sermon. But adventure, you are here and you are feeling, this is not for me. I have not begun. My life is wasted. And so the things you are talking about, I cannot, I can't fit. Because where I am at now, it is not possible that those things can happen. The grace of God is here for you. You can encounter God and get free from that guilt, from that pain, from that sin, from that situation that you think you do not fit and merit the things that we are talking about here. You are here and do not know Christ. You have an opportunity today. But number two, perhaps we are here and we are saying we are struggling Christians. We are making effort. I want to invite you to view the things that Paul says here in view with a lens of grace. With a lens of grace. To begin to see that God has made it possible for me to become his son and daughter, to become a child of God. And in my response of gratitude, in my reciprocity of what God has done to me, I can begin to bite off these things one by one. I can begin to endure my husband who is unbearing. I can begin to deal with my boss more graciously because he hasn't encountered this grace. I can begin to love my work even though sometimes it's painful and difficult. I can begin to experience a new beginning because God's grace is here.